Hello folks, I hope everybody is staying safe and is respecting all the social distancing guidelines from our dear government. I imagine we're all spending a lot of time online, so I'm glad you decided to take a few minutes of your day to join me as we talk about scalp massages and whether or not they're something that should be incorporated into the routine of someone who is fighting the good fight against hair loss. So, you know, I'll admit... I don't have an extreme amount of passion about this video because, you know, scalp massages are just something I've never really taken that seriously. I mean, I have done them myself before and for a little while, at least maybe for like three months, I actually hired a massage therapist to include scalp massages on the off chance that maybe they were beneficial despite never really taking them seriously. And, you know, they didn't do anything for me, but I felt good knowing I tried it at least. So, nevertheless, there are a lot of people who want to know more about scalp massages, so I decided I'd do a little research on them and keep an open mind because, you know, after all, this is not a product we're talking about here, so there doesn't seem to be as much of an opportunity to scam consumers like in the case of some uh, uh, dietary supplement like Provilus, which uh, promises the world but really is just salt, palmetto, and a multivitamin and a pill. It doesn't do jack shit. So let's examine the theory and mechanistic data behind scalp massages first before we get into the actual study. So it is common knowledge, you know, just a brief overview, it is common knowledge that hair loss is androgenic related to the majority of hair loss sufferers, with the biggest culprit, of course, being dehydrotestosterone, DHT. So while hair growth stimulants like minoxidil's mechanism action is unknown, we know that drugs like 5A, drugs like 5A reductase inhibitors such as finasteride work by suppressing the alpha, uh, the 5A reductase enzyme, which stops the conversion of testosterone to the much more damaging DHT on the scalp. So presence of DHT on hair follicles is bad and individuals with androgenic alopecia because it will eventually cause the miniaturization and then the eventual destruction of the hair follicles. So now, even though we know that finasteride and minoxidil work extremely well, especially when they're used in, conjunct, uh, in combination with each other, this hasn't stopped a lot of people from trying... Uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical related treatments and this is likely due to unfounded fears about the drug side effects or belief that the drug doesn't work for them which is unlikely considering that clinical trials behind finasteride showed that an 80 to 90 percent positive response to participants using finasteride and stopping the progression of androgenic alopecia and that's why you know I don't discount anybody's like uh, personal anecdotes uh, in their struggle against hair loss but when I have a lot of people saying oh finasteride's not working for me I'm a little bit skeptical I mean I'm not saying that they're lying but I do think that they need to give a drug a little bit more time or they're confusing an initial shed uh, for a continuation of their uh, androgenic alopecia when exact when in reality it's actually the opposite. When you're shedding, that's a sign that the uh, drug is working. So. Getting back on topic, one of these uh, new experimental categories of hair loss treatments, which have uh, really gained traction in the past 10 years, is called stimulation-based therapies. And this also includes microneedling, aka derma rolling. And like, like microneedling, the uh, theory behind scalp massages has a lot of overlap with microneedling. So the idea behind it is that soft tissue, when exposed to mechanical force, whether it be through manual stimulation via your hands or through the use of a tool like a micro needle slash derma roller. This will release antigen promoting growth factors and initiate wound healing. So the link between uh, this theory and how it relates to hair growth specifically is due to this Japanese study, which is from 2016, so pretty recent, which might explain the uh, recent popularity in this uh, style of uh, hair loss. And this, this study showed that nine Japanese men, when they were given uh, regular scalp massages for four minutes a day after 24 weeks, reported varying levels of hair growth and thickness. I mean, it, um, it varied like from minor to uh, nothing too dramatic, but from a minor to moderate, whatever that means, but um, everybody got some results. And you know, that sounds really good and that may sound like a, that may seal the deal for a lot of people. But the problem with this study is that the men tested are not men who have androgenic alopecia. And there is no evidence that these stretches and massages would have the same effect on men who actually do have androgenic alopecia. So it worked for them, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And the study also only included nine people. So even though the study examines gene expression of the dermal papillus cell, Cells, which are the cells that cause hair growth, this, sample, this study sample size is just way too small and also too lacking in diversity to really extrapolate it to the broad population. And uh, another thing I should also point out, uh, maybe a bit controversially, is that the out of all the populations, androgenic alopecia is especially uncommon in Japanese men. And thus, uh, data limited to just Japanese men may not reflect the broader hair loss population. I mean, if you just go uh, look at photos on a, on a Japanese subway train, for instance, uh, there's going to be almost no bald men. So there, there are some bald Japanese men, but I'm just pointing out that it's much less common in Japanese men compared to uh, Caucasian men, for instance. So... 
Looking at the other study, which I'm posting below, uh, what we have is an observational study, and the investigators of the study, they contacted 1,899 people who are researching treatments for androgenic alopecia beyond the two FDA-approved treatments, which are, of course, are finasteride and minoxidil. And out of these roughly 1,900 people, they, uh, they were offered a survey. And out of those people, about 340 uh, completed it, and 327 of them reported seeing the results of using a scalp massage in, in regards to uh, hair loss. So uh, the results specifically show that all the participants, uh, out of all the participants, 68.9% reported hair loss stabilization or regrowth. Um, the participants did anywhere from like 11 to 20 minutes of scalp massaging twice daily, and they were following the guidelines of a website, which I'm not going to repeat here, but you can look it up, and, but, it's, but it's mentioned in the study in case you want to read it yourself. And um, the website gave them instructions on how to do scalp massaging, and they totaled about 36.3 hours of scalp massage treatment before they saw results. And there were no variations based on age, gender, level of hair loss, or interestingly enough, usage of finasteride and uh, minoxidil or microneedling use. And the only variable uh, was it found in the study was that diffuse thinners did not get as good results as those who were reporting frontal or vertex thinning. And the theory behind that is, is that like uh, a diffuse thinning, even though it can be caused by androgenic alopecia, it's also sometimes seen as a cause of hair loss that is not related to uh, male pattern baldness. So on paper, this may seem very optimistic. However, one has to look to the limitations of the study to see why it's not something we should really hold that much faith in. So the first major flaw of the study is that many of these participants were already on other treatments. So even if their hair did get better, we can't really determine it was a scalp massage that did it unless, of course, we have a control group, which we don't because this is an observational study. It is not a double-blind randomized control study, which is considered the gold standard in the scientific community. So secondly, the hair assessment was... Uh, was self-assessed rather than observed by a medical professional. So things like hair count, follicular density, and whether the hair was in a prolonged antigen or telogen phase uh, were not factored into the study. So this doesn't mean that the study is bunk, just that we can't draw any good outcomes from the study unless we have better control. So to give you some context as to why I don't think this is a good study, uh, let's go ahead and compare it to an actual quality study uh, done in an actual FDA-approved medication like finasteride. So in the finasteride study, it's a 1998 study on finasteride's effectiveness in treating men with androgenic alopecia. And there were two one-year trials with 1,553 men aged between 18 to 41 years old who were all suffering from androgenic alopecia. All right. So the subjects were treated with either uh, one milligram of finasteride or placebo, about a 50-50 split, and the efficacy was evaluated by scalp hair counts, as well as patient and investigator assessments, as well as reviews by expert panels, and it wasn't just left up to the subjects to assess themselves. So the study concluded that in the trials, finasteride caused significant uh, clinical hair growth in the groups treated with one milligram of finasteride per day, and the groups treated with placebo experienced hair loss. So... That's a, that's a quality study right there, and that's just one of the many, many studies that finasteride underwent when it was undergoing clinical trials. So it just goes to show that like, in order for something to be FDA approved, it really, really means a lot. So in this study, uh, treatment was randomized, and neither the subject nor the investigators knew what the treatment was being given until the study was over. And you know that's the definition right there of a double-blind, randomized, controlled clinical trial. That's what a good study is. This is the kind of study that gets your treatment FDA approved. So you know, in conclusion, I think that uh, scalp massages, uh, they're pretty benign, but there isn't really enough data to conclude that the tissue manipulation in scalp massages uh, as theorized as an effective means of treating hair loss in men with androgenic alopecia. So, you know, sadly, the few scraps of data that do exist on tissue manipulation have resulted in some scam products being sold online and even being promoted on social media, such as uh, overpriced headbands. Like, I think there's like a $500 headband that works to massage the scalp to promote hair growth or some bullshit like that. So I really don't have anything against people trying new things, but I do think people who promote these alternative treatments are exploiting people's fears and misconceptions about uh, the two very effective and very safe FDA-approved treatments we already have on the market, which are 
finasteride and minoxidil. And those fears have driven people to put their hair at risk using theoretical treatments, which may not work, and thus they are putting their hair at risk since time is of the essence. I mean, we may not have time to waste on these uh, bullshit unfounded treatments. It's best if people just get on the proven treatments right away. So, you know, if people want to go ahead and try scalp massages. Uh, I don't have anything against it. I don't think there's no there's any harm in it necessarily, but I would never count on it being anything more than a weak adjunct treatment to existing proven treatments at best. And it's also possible it doesn't do anything at all. So you can determine whether or not you want to risk your hair on a potentially useless course of action and whether that is worth the risk. You know, for me personally, I'll stick with what has the strongest evidence and I'd rather not incorporate anything additional to that unless it is something I'm confident is going to work. It at least has some really good evidence behind it because, you know, fighting hair loss is a lifelong commitment and it's hard to stay motivated doing something you're not even certain helps. So, you know, that's why I like to do uh, squats over hip thrusters. So, you know, give it a try if you want to, but just, you know, you know my opinion, you can take it or leave it. But in any case, uh, good luck and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks.